So here's a uh, title, uh, Introduction, Epidemiology, uh, Pathophysiology. I, I will uh, dabble into measuring critical mechanical variables. I am a fracture uh, doctor, doctor, so uh, fractures uh, have uh, always uh, been my thing. And I will also try and uh, share a flavor that I think the post-traumatic ankle has tremendous uh, value uh, for research. Uh, this is uh, what it's all about. Uh, it's uh, moving from the left to the right uh, and uh, trying to alter the balance uh, in injured ankles, fractured injured ankles, other ankles between death and survival. Uh, and unfortunately in the ankle with our current treatment techniques, death is frequently the uh, result. Uh, just at the beginning, acknowledging uh, funding sources. Uh, this is just a small set of pictures, includes uh, Charlie, uh, Tom Brown, uh, Don Anderson, uh, that I think is on, uh, that have uh, contributed to a lot of the background uh, of this uh, thinking uh, and, uh, and research. Um, here are my uh, disclosures. I have no relevant personal disclosures, but uh, you will see one slide towards the end on a drug formulation that uh, my department uh, has a patent uh, on that uh, drug formulation. So here's uh, epidemiology. Uh, here is a paper from uh, our department. Tom Brown mostly uh, put it together. I think Charlie and I were mostly uh, writers and it was to try and uh, understand uh, the role of the three major joints in the lower extremity, uh, as well as to demonstrate that uh, post-traumatic arthritis was a significant part of the disease burden of lower extremity arthritis. Um, the ankle is commonly post-traumatic. Uh, the hip is relatively rare, a knee 10% and ankle uh, 80%. Uh, sprains, rotational ankle fractures are most common, but we will look at the more severe fractures. It can develop rapidly. And of course, I'm gonna say that's the hook uh, that it's good for uh, post-traumatic research in patients. It can develop rapidly or over many decades. And it has a high burden, uh, partly because of the uh, impact and disability that it causes that Charlie's already mentioned, as well as the fact that post-traumatic injuries occur at a younger age in a productive uh, time of uh, life. Um, here is uh, just an example uh, of the knee. Uh, this is a uh, from uh, a uh, clinical follow-up study of mine from uh, years ago, uh, a bad tibial plateau fracture, the uh, surgical treatment uh, with external fixation at the right, and this sort of idea that the knee articular cartilage after injury is relatively resistant to post-traumatic arthritis. The more congruent hip joint is prone to post-traumatic arthritis. And I've shown you two examples, a unusual anterior column fracture with a cysts on CT at one year and a failed joint um, within a year after a bad posterior wall fracture. But these injuries are uncommon and 90% of hippo to OA is not post-traumatic despite these examples that are fascinating for orthopedic traumatologists. Here's the data that Charlie uh, already uh, mentioned, uh, and, and this is from his time in Iowa, demonstrating the health-related outcomes impact of ankle osteoarthritis. Again, 80% post-traumatic arthritis happening in younger patients. And again, the same information that he shared illustrated in this slide. So the pathophysiology is frequently trauma, most frequently really severe injuries on the left, medium level fracture dislocation on the right, or lower level rotational injuries, or even sprains. The ankle is this very tight mortise, so it is susceptible to instability. And I think sometimes instability leads to quicker failure of the joint than actual articular step-offs and other injuries like that, illustrated in the subtle widening of the mortise in a stress view on the right. Here is a very 
subtle instability, a posterior subluxation of the ankle. Uh, you know, you can see the posterior wall fracture. You could say it's maybe not very displaced, but just this subtle posterior instability in an ankle that left untreated would fail quickly. Subtle syndesmotic instability. So look at that talus on the left, totally the opposite of the previous talus that was just sitting slightly posterior. Here's a tight anterior syndesmosis malreduction and a talus sitting just slightly uh, anterior. So subtle instability. Understanding the role of where the injury is in the joint. So the normal ankle joint loads anteriorly, slightly laterally, and injuries of the front of the ankle joint, impaction injuries, B2 and B3 fractures of the front of the ankle joint are bad injuries. The posterior malleolus is a bad injury because it leads to subluxation like in my previous illustration. But if you're looking at straight articular step-offs, you wanna avoid them in the front of the joint. Here's just an illustration of an old case of mine, anterior B3 fracture, three years and eight years of rapid and then consistent progression to post-traumatic osteoarthritis uh, um, from an anterior injury to the joint. Here's my favorite collage of a whole uh, rogues gallery of tibial plafond fractures. And even though these are all bad injuries, the severity of the injury is not the same. And if you want to study these injuries, you have to be able to correct for and understand the severity of injury, which is different across this interesting picture of distal tibia fractures. And this is uh, credited in a reference at the bottom and it's uh, straight Iowa work, but I uh, have to credit uh, Don Anderson uh, for uh, carrying the load on this uh, research, which it shouldn't be surprising to anybody that is interested in the amazing things that can be done computationally, that it is possible on a CT scan, which is standard of care for all the injuries pictured on the left, to be able to measure the surface area exposed by the injury, and that it would be different in single fragment fractures than it would be in comminuted fractures, and that it's possible to measure the articular displacement. And through these various means, it's possible to have an objective assessment of how badly the, in, the ankle was uh, injured uh, and, and what the differences are in those injuries in the collage of the left. So being able to measure the energy and displacement of the fracture. And that us as fracture surgeons and other orthopedists fascinated as we should be with putting the fracture back together and that you need to be able to have some measurement of how well you've actually done that and saying it's anatomic or it's not quite anatomic or, or it's perfect or putting a ruler on it to measure a plain x-ray is not good enough. And here's measuring uh, ankle uh, contact loading in ankles that I've treated, uninjured ankle on the left and injured ankles on the right. And as you would expect with imperfect reductions, increased mechanical contact loading. And really in these two slides, the severity of the injury and the contact loading of the treated fracture are the two big mechanical variables that relate to the pathophysiology of evolution towards post-traumatic osteoarthritis in bad injuries. Here's just an example. So here's a mid-level fracture dislocation of the ankle with a big uh, anterior fragment. And on, on the CT scan on the right, you see an imperfect reduction and you see the FE modeling on the left and sort of that edge loading, just like you would expect it to be uh, from that uh, imperfect uh, reduction. And here is that particular case with Sclerose, subchondral sclerosis of the anterior fragment at six months and loss of joint space at two years. And again, inter introducing 
now pictorially what I said at the beginning, that in these type of injuries, as you start to look at patient models to study candidate biological interventions, that you can get an outcome that you can measure. And in this example, you can see on plain radiographs within two years. And if you upgrade the technology to CT and weight-bearing CT, further work of uh, Don Anderson's uh, from uh, his lab, and the ability to actually measure the cartilage locally, regionally, and globally at six months after the injury, you can start to get an assessment of how the cartilage is behaving in a post-fracture injury model in a patient. And you can start to imagine having quantitative measurements to look at candidate interventions and do they make a difference. Unfortunately, uh, we are just really at the beginning of being able to have those candidate interventions in fracture patients. Most of the inter interest in early osteoarthritis has been in ACL. There are few large animal models or clinical studies. Relatively little is known about the complex biological series of events. And most of our interest over the decades of my career has been on the mechanical side and not on the biological side. And you have to understand the mechanical side because it clearly has an effect, but the future is in the biological side. And, and that sort of gets my last uh, few slides on arguing that these particular interesting ankle fractures where you can have an outcome relatively early are very good prospects for studying these value of research. So here's um, cadaveric uh, impaction injuries of the distal tibia, experimental pilon fractures, if you will. There's the fracture edge pictured on the top. Green cells are live cells, red cells are dead cells. And this slow progression over two days from living cells to dead cells, implying that something is happening. And maybe that something would be a possibility of an intervention. And you could say, well, maybe it's just partially injured cells that are going on to die, which is why I like this experiment. And this is impacting cartilage, taking the impacted media and putting it in normal cells that have not been impacted. And in the blue and the red, the severity of impaction makes a difference in the chondrocyte proliferation of the uninjured cartilage cells. Again, the implication that there's something in the injury that's causing this progressive zone of cell death and again, opening the possibility that we can do something about it. Here's a large animal model. So as you see on the right, Yucatan mini pig, 70 kilograms. So in the pig world, that's a mini, as you see some maxis below, but it is still a pretty large animal model that closely simulates the human ankle joint, the uh, mini pig uh, hawk. This is a uh, Jess Getz's uh, animal model uh, published in uh, 2015. And this is Mitch Coleman's work of putting amobarbital as an antioxidant in the pig hock after an experimental tibial pilon fracture. You see radiographically illustrated at the top, injured in the second picture, being reduced in the middle picture, just the same instruments we would use in, interoperatively fixed with plates and screws. And at six month follow-up, the talus, so this is the talus, the opposite side of the injured distal tibia with loss of cartilage, with no treatment other than internal fixation. And on the right side with antioxidant treatment, preserved cartilage. This paper was in uh, science, again, Mitch Coleman, uh, lead author. 
So that uh, just is a little flavor uh, of what I think about uh, injured ankles, post-traumatic ankles, rapid progression to post-traumatic arthritis, the ability to be able to measure things, and then this exciting uh, cusp of being able to look at candidate biological interventions. I think intra-articular fractures of the ankle are uh, excellent uh, models for this. The time of injury is known. Primary OA is rare in the ankle. The outcome of interest is common. You've got sort of this 50-50 uh, model. We can measure critical variables and the result can be detected within a time frame that's reasonable to propose to funding agencies. Uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for your attention to what I think is this really interesting area. Thank you.